Well, as Dina told you, I will talk about XPCS mainly for the study of soft chemistry synthesis of catalyst. Well, for the design of efficient catalyst, we have to use all the tools we have available in material science. So we should we have to understand the properties, the mechanisms, and also be able to answer these questions. For example, how we can control hierarchical structure. What's the relationship between function and structure? And for this, we have to combine physics and chemistry. And during this presentation, I will show you how we can use the coherent X-ray scattering techniques to probe dynamics and structure that can help us to answer some of these questions. So using coherent X-rays, techniques, we can study this 3D structure of the materials using the coherent X-ray diffraction imaging. Then it will give us information about 2D and 3D morphology, porosity, defects, phase distribution, and so on. And using X-ray photocorrelation spectroscopy, XPCS, we can probe dynamics. What kind of dynamics? Aggregation, phase separation, transitions are some examples. And these techniques, they can be still even more powerful if we perform in situ and operando study. So in the in situ study, we will follow a material in a real condition. So for example, during a synthesis of a catalyst and a operando study, we will follow a material in a work condition. So for example, a catalyst during a reaction, we will, we will analyze the catalyst using the scene control techniques. And at the same time, we will follow the result of this reaction using another technique. So this presentation, it will be most dedicated to dynamics. But just before going to dynamics, I would like to show you an example of operando study of a catalyst using coherent X-ray diffraction imaging. So this is a work I did during my postdoc when I arrived here at the Brazilian Syncontrol. So the first technique that I worked based in coherent X-rays, it was Bragg CDI. Now I changed to XPCS, completely different techniques, but uh, I keep the focus on material size and catalysts. So in this work, we produced shaped controlled nanoparticles. So using a colloidal synthesis, we could produce these really nice gold nanocubes, cubic tiedron, and we went to the APS, to the 34 IDC beam line, to study these nanoparticles in operando black CDI during the CO oxidation reaction. So this is a model reaction, but also an important reaction that will have happening in our cars every day. So when we perform coherent diffraction imaging in Bragg condition, in addition to the 3D morphology, we also have the 3D distribution of the displacement field and the strain. So in a crystalline material, when you have a perfect crystal, the X-rays will be diffracted with a constant phase difference. When you have a defect, it will produce a phase offset. And using the algorithms for phase retrieval, we can obtain the 3D distribution of the displacement field and also calculate the strain. Strain is really important for catalysis because when we have a strained region in a crystal, it will affect the electronic properties at that region. So it will affect the binding energy and also the dissociation energy. So when we have tensile strain, it will lower the barrier of the dissociation energy. So it's more likely that the reaction will happen in these regions of tensile strain because it will alter the D-band, the D-band center. So we follow these nanoparticles during the reaction and we could observe the location of this tensile strain, how it was formed during the reaction. And we could have information about the different reactivity of similar facets 
And also this reaction presents a high stereosis behavior. And we could understand better this phenomenon also in a single particle level. Well, so this was, just want to give you this example, this, this nice work that we did a few years ago. And using this operand study, we can have this information about the relationship between structure and activity. But now I'm still into catalysis, but I changed my interest to macroporous catalysts. Macroporous catalysts are nice materials for the production of flow microreactors for liquid phase reaction. And in these recent years, it's a growing demand of replace the batch reactors for flow reactors, mainly in the chemical and in the pharmaceutical industry. When you use a flow reactor, it has several advantages. It speeds the reaction rate up. It's easier for the reactants to assess the activity sites. And there are also no need of separation and purification steps. And so it's a more environmentally friendly process. I'm particularly interested in producing this, this macroporous catalyst for the synthesis of activity pharmaceutical ingredients. For this, we have also to include the activity, the activity species that are gonna be nickel, palladium, or copper. So have to be able to produce a porous materials with well-controlled porosity to allow an efficient mass transfer, and also be able to include this catalytic activity species well distributed in these macroporous materials. And in this presentation, I will show you how you can use XPCS to help us to understand the formation of the porosity and also distribution of this activity phase. So there are several approaches to produce this kind of material. A very attractive approach, synthetic approach, is the use of the social synthesis. Using this method, we can prepare a catalyst in very few steps. We do not need high temperature or high pressure, the solvents are usually water or ethanol. And in this method, we start from an alkoxide or a metal, a salt metal, and then it will go into reaction of hydrolysis, hydrolysis and polycondensation, forming the gel network. To prepare catalyst, supported catalysts using this method, we can include the precursors, the metallic precursors during the synthesis of the gel. And then we have the metallic species well dispersed in the gel structure. So it will allow us to have a higher dispersion than the impregnation of a metal after the, the, the formation of the porous materials. And also it will, allow us to obtain more stable activity spaces, homogeneous dispersed. The macroscopic properties of these materials will strongly depend on the microscopic organization and mobility. So it's very important to understand the dynamics in these transitions. If, so this it is a good method to produce a supported catalyst. If you want to include macropores in this material, we can combine the cell gel transition and phase separation, spinal down decomposition. So for this, we will add a polymer that will work as a phase separation inducer. When the gelation is progress, it will increase the tendency of phase separation between a gel-rich phase and the solvent-rich phase. Then we can remove the solvent-rich phase by heat treatment and we obtain a macroporous materials. So the important thing in this process is to combine the gelation time and the phase separation because when we have the gelation, we have the solidification of this material that will frozen this transient structure then we can remove the solvent phase and obtain this interconnected, to, to, uh, interconnected macropores structure. And the domain, the control of the domain size distribution 
it will depend on the dynamic and kinetics of these both processes, gelation and the phase separation. So in these systems, we have a complex dynamics because it involves network formation during gelation and also dynamic asymmetries between the two phases. And you have several dynamic processes going on at the same time from nanometer scale to micro micrometer scale. So at the early stage of gelation, we will have the aggregation of the small clusters. Then we're gonna have the gel network formation and then the phase separation. So to, to understand this process, we have to be able to probe length scale from nanometers to micrometers and a broad, broad time scale as well from milliseconds to minutes to hours. And XPCS is a technique that will allow us to cover the, this, this broader range of size and time. Well, XPCS, it's, it's similar to dynamic light scattering, but using X-rays, we have the advantage to not be limited to the transparent samples, which with, 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 is not the case of this material at all because they're opaque white gels. And we can also cover a larger length scale. Well, so I know that in this web series seminars, you had really nice presentations about XPCS. I attended some of them, but I will talk in a few words about the XPCS just to remember and for those who are here for the first time. So in the XPCS experiment, we're gonna illuminate the sample with X-ray coherent beam. It will produce eye speckle pattern that carries out the exactly arrangement, special arrangement of the sample. Then if we collect several images, like hundreds of thousands of images with a constant time difference between them, we can select a region of interest and we'll have the fluctuation of the intensity. And then using the out, the out correlation function, we can calculate the out correlation curve. So here we're going to use the intensity of similar pixels with the same Q vector and also the same delay time and we average and we can obtain this correlation curve. This correlation curve will give us many information about dynamics. So well the the correlation function has exponential decay that decays to the baseline. Here we can obtain the relaxation time and this speck of contrast is related with the instrument. The shape of this exponential decay, it will give us information about the nature of the relaxation process going on in the sample. So the, sim the simple example is when you have a single exponential decay. So the gamma exponent is equal to one. It's observed when we have a single relaxation time, a free diffusion, a Brownian motion. When you have a stretch exponent, gamma smaller than one, it's typical observed when you have a distribution of relaxation times. So for example, it's observed in supercooled liquids where in the same sample, we have different regions of the sample relaxing with different times. And when you have a compressed exponent, it's characteristic when you have super diffusion motion or Baliski motion. It's commonly observed in soft solids like gels, colloids, polymers, when you have an internal stress relaxation. So fitting our correlation function, we can obtain this, this, this this exponent that can help us to understand the nature of our relaxation process. So now I will move to the results, the most interesting part. So we use a combination of XPCS and USACS, ultra small angle X-ray scattering, to study in situ the social process 
and phase separation for the synthesis of macropore silica and the nickel silica materials. So when we perform an ex vicious experiment, we will, we will collect a lot of images to calculate the autocorrelation function. If you average this image and integrate it, we also obtain the Sachs curve at, during the same experiment. And you can combine this structure information and dynamic information to understand the, the mechanism of the sample. So the main, the main goal of this work it was to understand the structure evolution and the nanoscopic dynamics at the late stage of the gelation and phase separation. We'd like to understand this moment when we have this phase separation, separation and the solidification of this gel network that we arrested this transient state that give then uh, that will form then the macropore structure. So to produce this material, use this, we use the cell gel and phase separation synthesis. We used a polymer PO as the phase inducer. So after stirring, aging, drying, and we perform the calcination to remove the solvent and the polymer and we obtain these materials. So when we do not include a polymer in the systems, we have a no macroporous structure, including a correct amount of the polymer. We observe the formation of this really nice interconnected macroporous structure with the median size around 600 nanometer. We could also include the nickel, successfully include the nickel in the synthesis, it do not lead to the collapse of the gel. It can happen. It's challenged to find these this conditions. And we, we obtain a high surface, surface area material. And we observe a decrease of the surface area in the addition of nickel. Looking closer to this nickel sample, here we can observe this, this, this test, test texture here. It's also this really small mesopores, about 3.5 nanometers that are formed in this voids in the gel network naturally, even in the sample without the polymer. And we can observe the nickel nanoparticles well distributed in the gel structure. We have some very small nanoparticles and also some agglomerates. So we went to the cateter line to study this, this, this process in situ. So we used a sample to detect a distance of 15 meters, the energy 9 keV. The temperature was 40 degrees. We followed this, this reaction during 360 minutes. And as we were interested in the late stage of the reaction, we, we studied the slow dynamics using a frequency of one hertz. So here you have a photo of the catheter experimental hutch. And here you can see the vacuum chamber where the detector is placed inside. So we follow the dynamics during the the synthesis of this material, we observed that up to 209 minutes, we have a really fast dynamic, so we, we could not uh, follow these dynamics. But with time, that this dynamic starts to slow down during the late stage of the reaction, so after 300 minutes. This is due to the constrained motion of the scattered clusters in the gel network we can obtain more information about this dynamic if you look the Q dependence of the relaxation time and the gamma exponent. So here I select this green curve at 330 minutes and here is the correlation function in function, in function of Q. And we observed for this sample we have a next point bigger than one which is widely observed in sort of soft solids, so we have this compressed exponent. This is characteristic of hyperdiffusive motion. 
when you have the relaxation of heterogeneous internal stress. And this stress in the gel network, then they can be built during the cluster aggregation to form this gel network. So it seems that here after 300 minutes, we have a, this, 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 this gel structure and we could follow this, this stress of this network. To have more information about the time evolution of these dynamics, we can also look to the true time correlation function. So as I show you, when we calculate the one time correlation function, we average the correspondent time. But when you have heterogeneous dynamics, this becoming a problem. So in this case, we do not average and we correlate all the image in relation of each other. And we obtain this two-time correlational map. For this map will give us information about the different states in the sample. So when you have an equilibrium system, the contour lines are parallel. When you have a slowdown dynamics, we observe a broadening of these contour lines. And when you have acceleration process, they will narrow with time. So here, I present you the, time, the, the two time correlation maps for the sample during the late stage of the, the, the gelation. What we observed in the beginning, it's a gradual slowing down of the dynamics. So this is expected as the gelation goes on network fluctuations are greatly suppressed. And then it seems that the really late the really late states, we have an arrest dynamics. So it could be the arrest of safe phase separation. Well, to have more information about this time dependent evolution, we can also observe how the relaxation time and the gamma exponent will evolve with time. So it's interesting to observe at 330, we observe a change in dynamics. It's, it goes from a stretch exponent to a compressed exponent. And we also observe this change in the relaxation time evolution. So it seems something really changed in the sample in this, this, this last minutes. And we can look to the structure of the sample to try to understand better what changed. So here it's the u sachs curve obtained during the same experiment. We observe this, the Guinea plateau that it's increasing intensity with time and shifting to low Q. So we calculated the Guinea gyrator radius. It's interesting to note that during the gelation, the ratio is grow slowly. It could be the clusters that are growing as a result of the polycondensation reactions. And then suddenly it increased and formed structures of more than 400 nanometers. And then it's stabilized. So what we believe at this point, so combine this, this structure evolution and dynamic evolution was where we have a really difference between 320 and 330 minutes, we believe that at this point we have the phase separation. So we have the gel network that's low and growing. It's induced phase separation that at this point we have the phase separation. And then the slowing down of the dynamic could be related with the cause coarsening of this phase separate domains. So it seems that it's a really slow process, the phase separated. And when it's happening, it's, it happened when the gelation, it's, it's really solid, it's a solid network that will freeze this, this, this transient of phase separated. Well, when we include nickel in the systems, it completely changed the dynamics. What we observed, it's alternate correlated and uncorrelated states. So it could be related with the intermittent fluctuation 
indicates that you have a large scale rearrangement when you have the, the nickel in this gel network. So as we saw in microscopy, the nickel, it is well dispersed in this gel network. We believe that these nickel centers created a higher stress in this location. And it's why we, we saw this alternate correlated and uncorrelated states. When you look for to the SACs, to the structural evolution, at the early stage of gelation, nickel seems to also affect the structure. But at the late stage of gelate, gelation, it's very similar to the sample without nickel. It makes sense because even if nickel is created a lot of stress in the gel network, we obtain macroporous structure even with, with nickel. So it's a stressed network. It's affected more the gel network than the phase separation. So I'll combine this in situ XPCS and USACs. We could understand better the mechanisms of the, the cell gel and phase separation. Even though this is a well-established method to produce uh, chromatograph columns for high-performance liquid chromatograph, it is it's basically a trial and error experiment. So people, they change the concentration of polymer and solvent, and they try to find the condition where you obtain macropores. And with this study, we'd like to show better the mechanisms, the time, when the, the different process happening and understand better this mechanism, we can optimize the synthesis and produce the materials with optimized uh, structure. So combining this, the dynamics and structure, you saw that the gelation, it's really slow process with a slow growth of these small clusters. We could not see dynamics because there are two small dynamics are too fast. Then after this time, we have the, the, the progress of the polycondensation reaction. We will induce the phase separation. And once the phase separation takes place, this special arresting of this transient state, the dynamic is low down, and you have this frozen systems of gel with a transient phase separate inside. The introduction of nickel strongly affects the dynamic and the early stage of the gelation. Well, as so this is an ongoing study, it's very recent results. We, are still, we still have a lot of questions to answer. And the next step, we would like to study the early stage of gelation. So for this, we need to acquire data with a higher fre frequency to follow the dynamics of this smaller clusters during the, the gelation. And also, I just show one example, but change the, this polymer concentration, we will change a lot the porosity of the material. So we also interested in understanding better the effect of the phase separation inducer in the gelation and also in the phase separation. Then we can figure out the whole picture of the systems. And also for the introduction of metal, we would like to try other nickel precursors to try to, to see if we can obtain a less stressed gel in presence of nickel and then avoid to lose a surface area that it's, it's very important for catalysis. Well, so this was an example of the study of this slow dynamics during the late stage of gelation and phase separation. In this last part of the presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the catheter tabbing line. So the catheter tabbing line is dedicated to the coherent and time result scattering. We work with main, three main techniques. So the coherent X-ray imaging, we're doing most tychography and also we're commissioning plane wave. Also, we can perform XVCS as I show you the example and USACs. So here 
we have this long chamber, vacuum chamber that allow us to work at different samples detector distance. The beam size that we measured during commission, it's, it's around 40 microns. And here I have information about the energy flux available and also the energy range, the coherent flux and the energy range. So here we have an illustration of the location of the main components of catheter tabby line. Here we have the vertical focus mural, the horizontal focus murals, the 4CM monochromator that can be retractable and we can work with monochromatic bin or with pink bin. I put some more information about the detector because it is in-house development between a Brazilian company called PTEC and the LNLS. So this is a, a detector based on the MedPix technology. It's a large area detector with 3,072 pixels by 3,072 pixels. Not, not very important for XPCS where we illuminate only a very small part of the detector, but it is very important for imaging techniques. And we have a small size of pixels with 50, 50 microns. For XPCS, the maximum frame rate available today is one kilohertz. And there is a possibility to upgrade to 200, 200 hertz. So I showed you an example of slow dynamics, but at Caterete, as I just mentioned, we can also study faster dynamics. So here it's an example, the study of dynamics of a colloid of gold, colloid of gold nanoparticles in a mixture of glycerol and water. So these measurements were done at one kilohertz and we can, here have the Sachs curve, the scattering pattern, the, the average one. Here the correlation function, and we from the, the the correlation curves we obtain the hydrodynamic radius that fits well the expected value. In Caterete, we also have the opportunity to work with monochromatic bean or peak bean. So we, we try to characterize the, the impact of this two different modes in XPCS. So when we use pink bean, well, the signal it's much stronger, but we lose speckled contrast. So it seems that we improve the signal to noise ratio, but we lose speckled contrast. But anyway, it can be interesting for samples that are very diluted or do not scatter well, but for sure in this case, for samples that are not sensible to radiation damage. So there are just two opportunities. And I also would like to show you some recent results from users. So as I was talking to Dina, last year we started to have users during commissioning. And we had this group from a Brazilian university at Rio de Janeiro. They studied the phases, the liquid liquid phase separation of proteins. So this liquid liquid phase separation is it's a natural mechanism in the cell that cell use to, organ to organize. However, it's also associated with a variety of disease. And it's not, when you have this liquid liquid fed separation of proteins, they, not, they do not form simple liquid. And it can be liquid, gel, even glass, solid. And the state of this protein condensate will affect the, the function of the proteins in the cell. And can, it's related with the, this, this disease. So we used XPCS to probe this viscoelastic properties and the relaxation behavior of these condensates and then understand better what was the state. So in this work, they studied the prior protein, liquid phase separation, and they were interested in understanding better what was the effect of different ligands. So 
we studied this, this proteins condensates that were formed in presence of copper and the, 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 the condensates formed in the presence of copper and peroxide. Looking at the autocorrelation function, function, we can well clearly see the difference. In this case, we, we do not follow the phase separation. We, we, the sample was already separated and we are interested in the study dynamics of the condensated. So it's relatively slow dynamics. And in addition, with the addition of copper, we have a compressed exponent. And when we add also peroxide, we have, sorry, this stretch exponent. And even when we add peroxide, we have this compressed exponent. What analyzing the, the key dependence of relaxation rate and gamma exponent, we could observe that in this case, with introduction of copper, it seems that the dynamic that we are looking for, it's the dynamic related with the coarsening process of the protein droplets. And when they add also peroxide, it will form a gel-like phase. So we can obtain hardening condensates. And this it's, it's important for them to understand better what to change the function of this, this protein inside the cell when you have this still liquid phase or this really more solid, soft to solid phase. So this work was submitted a few weeks ago and preprint is already available. Well, so to summarize this, this presentation, I hope I could show you how we can use XPCS to understand dynamics of a large length scale and uh, time scale. And this will help us to understand out of equilibrium state in heterogeneous systems as this example of these complex systems that it's composed by a gel network and also phase separated regions. So using the coherent X-ray techniques, imaging in XPCS, we can understand the better dynamics and structure in the large, different kind of materials from organic and inorganic, liquids, gels, different kind of materials, understand better the local dynamics. We can understand global kinetics and the collective phenomena that are going on on the sample. And well, last slide, I just want to say that there are six bin lines in operation at Sirius. So last December, we have our first proposal, regular call for proposals. So we should have another one soon. If you are interested in comments to, to perform your experiments in series, we have these six pin lines available with these different techniques. You'll be welcome. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katerete Group, for all the work. It was hard these last years of commissioning, but we are really happy that now we are having users and we start to, to, to operate in the regular conditions. And thank you, 